Hey guys, Julie's with me. Say what's up. What's up? <laughs> I'm covering faculty objective number 21. It's explain the relationship between neuronal fiber diameter, myelination, and co uh, conduction velocity. So I'm not just going to say that this is what the relationship is. I'm going to try my best to explain this relationship using uh, concepts and then going into physics. So let me start off with the concept of why larger diameter increases velocity. So basically what you have is, um, let's, let's give you a small, this is a small diameter axon, and, um, and then here's a larger diameter axon. All right, and I'm not going to explain exactly how the membrane potential is created, but I am going to reiterate that you have uh, a sodium channel. So if we uh, bring this up, we have a little sodium channel where sodium can come in, and we have uh, potassium channels where potassium can go out, and then we have the sodium potassium pumps. So NaK pumps, and those use ATP. So if you remember right, we have if we have a, a sodium come in here. So let's say actually that we have a sodium that's right here. And it wants to. It can go in any direction, and that it uh, that's a possible. So it's moving. It can move in any three-dimensional direction in the world. So there's an infinite number of them. And so what we want to do is we want it to move in this direction. We want it to move down the the myelin. And so what would cause it to do that? Well, so it's just based on odds. So half of the sodiums are going to go in this vector, the other half are going to go in this vector. The things that will help prevent it moving in the, the uh, backwards vector is if one moves this way already, um, this, the next one's not going to want to move that way, but then if one moves this way, the next one's going to want to move this way, so based on charge, repelling charge. However, it's just a 50-50 split. So if you have this 50-50 split, what would cause it to go a longer distance? Well, in the cell we have uh, various obstacles. So let's say we have a protein here. If there's a protein here, then this has only so many uh, directions that it can go to uh, move in the direction of propagation that we want. So it can move here, it would ver move a very short distance and run into a wall. Of the, of the cell, or it can move up, it would also run into a wall, it can move straight forward, run into a protein, or it can move at a diagonal to get the greatest distance and then run into the wall of the, uh, the cell membrane uh, a little bit further down. Now let's look at the much wider, uh, I may have to shrink this up, the much wider um, uh, axon. So if we have a sodium here, this Na+, and we have, let's make it the same density. So we have the same density of obstacles in the way of our sodium, uh, molecule, our sodium ion. However, we have a greater number of possible ways for the sodium to move forward because of the greater uh, diameter that this uh, vessel has. So the greater diameter, it decreases the number, uh, it, it increases the probability that the sodium can move a farther distance without being blocked because there are just clearly more opportunities for sodium to move this, this distance rather than this distance. However, with a larger uh, diameter of axon, it's going to have more opportunities to move farther. There's one thing that's going to decrease the probability is that there's going to be um, more transporters to allow uh, sodium to leak out. So there could be a leak channel here. And if you imagine that this is in three-dimensional space, there could be another leak channel here, and another one here, and another one here, and another one here. And then on the back side, there could also be leak channels. So there's more leak channels, more chances for sodium to also get out. However, uh, it's not as great of a problem as, as having obstacles preventing it from moving in the forward direction. So that's how a larger diameter will increase the conduction velocity of an action potential. Now I want to talk about myelination. So here's me in my microscope, and I'm going to zoom in on my... Uh, so at increased magnification, what we will see is we have an axon with uh, myelin around it. And in, in this axon, so we're going to have some positives on the outside, a whole bunch of positives, and this is going to act as a capacitor. So we're going to have separation of charge by a certain amount of space, so we're going to have a capacitor going in three dimensions. Now you may remember the formula for capacitance. So the capacitance is, 
is defined as, that's the three lines instead of the equal sign, it's the three lines. It's defined as the charge divided by the potential difference. So it's saying how much charge, so how much Q is required to get a given voltage at this capacitance. So the, the answer to that is if we have a very high capacitance you have to have a whole bunch of charge to get a given voltage. So let's just say our voltage is negative 50 because that's where action potential, uh, that's the threshold. So let's just say at negative 50, so delta V equals negative 50, how many charges do we have to have right here at this capacitance? Well, let's just figure out what the capacitance is, right? So there's another equation that you can use for capacitance. Capacitance is equal to the dielectric constant times the permittivity of free space times the area of the capacitor over the uh, distance between the two plates. So really, capacitance really doesn't re matter about the... the um, it doesn't really matter what the potential difference is or the charge, those things are not independent. The, the independent things are area and the distance. So the area of the capacitance cannot change. It, it, the capacitor cannot change. It's stuck. It's, a, it's an axon. The diameter, however, we can make it change. If the diameter is really small, capacitance will be really high. Molly joins us now. Say hi, Molly. So what you're going to see is here where the cell membrane, where, where the, let's see, right here where the cell membrane is thin, you're going to have a high capacitance. Where you have the myelin sheaths, you're going to have a very low capacitance. What does that mean? That means that at the, right here, to get to negative 50, you have to have a lot of charge. Right here, to get to negative 50, you have to have very little charge. So you might only have to have a couple of positives on the outside and a couple of negatives on the inside. And since fewer ions have to take change place, the the voltage is conducted faster. Now I know I said that right here where the myelin sheath is, the capacitance is low, and I said it's because of the distance between here, but there's also another phenomenon called the, co the uh, equivalent capacitance. So it, whenever the myelin sheath wraps around the first time, that's one capacitor. When it wraps around the second time, that's another capacitor. Whenever it wraps around the third time, there's another capacitor. So now we have capacitors in series. And so whenever you look at the equation for a capacitor in series, you want to get the equivalent capacitance. So the one over the equivalent capacitance Capacitance. That means the total capacitance when you combine all of them in series is equal to 1 over the capacitance in the first uh, capacitor plus 1 over the capacitance in the second capacitor and you could go on and on and on. And uh, so the way you, you would write this is that CEQ is equal to uh, 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3 and this would go on and on and you would put that to the negative 1 power. So not only the fact that you have a certain distance between your myelin and the cell uh, plasm, you also have this, this phenomenon known as the equivalent capacitance that also decreases. So both of those uh, things decrease the capacitance of the myelinated axon. Okay, so now that the conceptual thing is out of the way, there's um, and you understand that it has something to do with probability of uh, movement in a, for a certain length, and you know that it has something to do with capacitance. I'm going to try to elucidate what those are. There's something called a time constant, and there's something else called a length constant. The time constant tau is for action potentials and for capacitors and, and things like that. It is for them what the 0 to 60 uh, rating is for a car. So, for example, if a car can go 0 to 60 in 3 seconds, it's probably going to be faster than a car that can go 0 to 60 in 10 seconds. So that would be slower. The point being is that the lower the time constant is, the faster your propagation is going to be. Now, the equation for the time constant is time constant is equal to the resistance of the membrane times the capacitance of the membrane. So like I said, it's got something to do with the capacitance. 
Like, and with the example of the myelin, you have low capacitance, so you want to have a low time constant to make things faster. With the resistivity of the membrane, this is the simply the reciprocal of the permeability. So the permeability and the resistivity are the reciprocal of each other. Now, so the first point I want to make with this is that the conduction velocity is going to be um, it's going to be propor indirectly proportionate or inversely proportionate to the time constant tau. Now, what is this time constant, anyways? So let me explain that kind of. Uh, for you as well. So imagine that you have a a current and you've got it opened up and it's going into the cell. So here's your your po your negative and your positive charge. So that that would be your, your voltage there. And as soon as you close this, the very second you close this, over here you're going to record the action potential. So the very second you close this, the the current going into it jumps up. So this would be the current I and this would be time. So the very second you close it, the current jumps up. However, the very second you close this stuff, you also have the action potential or the, the membrane potential. So this would be membrane potential, and this would be time. And it doesn't jump up immediately. It goes up in a logarith logarithmic function till it reaches some maximum point. And so at the point where it is at 66. Uh, sixty-three percent of its maximum uh, permeability, or I'm sorry, maximum potential. At sixty-three percent of that, that is called tau. Whatever that time is in milliseconds, that is tau. And tau is the time constant. And to reiterate, tau is equal to the resistivity of the membrane times the capacitance of the membrane, and the conduction velocity is inversely proportionate to tau. So if tau is small, velocity goes up. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the length constant. So I want you to imagine you have a really long steel rod, really long steel rod, and over here you're gonna put a hot plate and you're going to wait. So this really long steel rod, let's imagine it spans the entire length of the hospital. So it's the entire length of the hospital and you put it on uh, a really small hot plate at one end. And now after we allow everything to come to equilibrium, after we allow everything to come to equilibrium, you're going to have this part, it, the heat hasn't changed here at all. So the change in heat or the change in temperature equals zero. And then somewhere close, very proximally, the change in temperature is going to equal the difference between the hot plate and the bar, when it, whatever it originally was. And then closer to the middle, your change in temperature is going to be uh, greater than, so zero is, uh, zero is less than the change in temperature is less than the difference between the hot plate and the bar. So you're going to have an intermediate amount in the middle. So we're doing the function of the change of temperature over the, over the length, per unit of length. And so that would be like a length constant for this, this heat movement. But we're looking at, heat, uh, at the length constant for an action potential. And so we're asking ourselves, uh, what, is the ch what is the potential as the ions move down the, uh, the myelin axon, or the axon? So whenever you first get the potential, it's really high. And then as it gets a little bit further, some of the potential drops off, and if a little further, some of the potential drops off, and it keeps going. As long as we keep it above negative 50, we can still spark another um, action potential right here, but whenever it gets below that, we can no longer spark an action potential at that point. And so the idea with the length constant is if we have this um, millivolts recorded here, so we have the, the potential and we have the length of the axon here. So if we, we know that we want to get to negative 50 and we're starting at negative uh, 60 or 70, well at 66 or at 63 percent, so at, at uh, 56, at negative 56, this would be where we have one time constant or one length constant. So it's going to, the millivolts are going to drop exponentially as we get there. And so at this length right here equals the length constant. And so like I said, this is 63%. So it would really be 56.3 millivolts, but uh, that's not really an issue. 
Now the length constant has a specific equation. The length constant is equal to the square root of the diameter times the resistivity of the membrane divided by 4 times the resistivity of the intracellular fluid. So the, the velocity is going to be proportional, directly proportional, to the time constant and inversely proportional, I mean to the length constant, and inversely proportional to the time constant. So if we wanted to, we could take this equation and plug it in here, and we could take the time constant tau is equal to um, Rm times Cm, and plug it in here. Molly's on her way to med zoo. Say my, bye, Molly. So let's do some fancy algebra. How about we do that? So if we have the, the velocity is equal to, and we're going to put the lambda on top, so we'll get the square root of distance times the resistivity of the membrane divided by 4 times the resistivity of the intracellular fluid. And we're going to divide that by um, the resistivity of the membrane times the uh, capacitance of the membrane. What I'm going to do really quick, though, is if I have uh, the resistivity of the membrane, I can say the resistivity of the membrane is equal to the square root of the resistivity of the membrane squared. So I'm going to go ahead and do that so I can have this term right here. So I'll put that in there. And then what I can do is I can combine these things together. So I can say the conduction velocity is equal to 1 over the cap uh, capacitance of the membrane times the square root of the distance times the resistivity of the membrane divided by the resistivity of the membrane squared times 4 times the resistivity of the intracellular fluid. And what's going to happen is this is going to cancel out and the squared is going to cancel out and I'll end up with the simple equation of the conduction velocity is equal to 1 over the capacitance of the membrane times the square root of the distance divided by the resistivity of the membrane times 4 times the resistivity of the intracellular fluid. And that's the equation for the conduction velocity of an action potential. Now what does this show us? Well, it shows us exactly what we just talked about. If we decrease the capacitance, which is adding myelin, so adding myelin, we increase the conduction velocity, direct, we directly affect one-to-one -one by decreasing the capacitance, we get a one-to-one one one increase on the conduction velocity. However, we, we also said that we can change the diameter. Well, that's true, but if I want to double my conduction velocity, I have to quadruple my diameter because it's a square root function. And so, for example, if we wanted to, if we, our optic nerves, they are myelinated, so our optic nerves fire very fast. If we were to demyelinate our optic nerves and expect velocity of the same speed, the, all of the optic nerves would take up the entire volume of the brain, of the, of the cranium. So you would have no brain if you wanted your optic nerves to fire as fast as they do by simply adjusting their diameter rather than by adding myelin. Now myelin does one other thing and it's kind of a uh, a tricky thing because it, it you remember if you add myelin around something you're also removing cellular transporters so you're reducing the you're increasing the resistivity of the membrane you're re reducing the permeability of the membrane but however that has less effect it has less effect on the resistivity because it's under the square root than it does on the capacitance so although you're reducing resistivity you're increasing you're you're decreasing you're also decreasing capacity. I said that wrong. You're increasing the resistivity of the membrane, but you're decreasing the capacity by m the capacitance by much, much more. And further, by removing all those channels, you're, you're preventing the, uh, the ions from leaking out, so you get less leak and less loss of charge along the conduction route. So that also is another effect, uh, uh, an effect you want to have in your mind that is hard to bring out by the equations and following things through.